Well, thank you very much to everyone for joining today. Um, a warm welcome to the Exora webinar around how technology is driving sustainability in mining. Um, I'm Nick Mayhew, a Chief Commercial Officer here at Exora, and excited to have uh, Pat on video with us uh, today. Pat's had a long and successful career in mining for organizations like Anglo-American, and most recently he was Technical Director for De Beers. I'd like to thank you all for joining today. And if you're listening on demand, hope you're keeping safe in these unique circumstances, <coughs> which we're all living on. I think we're all learning to do uh, video webinars, uh, much more than we have in the past. So uh, before I hand to Pat, um, I wanted to spend a few minutes introducing Exora to you. We're a brand new startup, uh, launching initially in minerals and mining and oil and gas sectors, um, but we'll soon be expanding uh, beyond that. We're an innovation hub for digital solutions and we're helping leading global organizations discover proven and best-in-class technologies to support and accelerate digital transformation. So we provide a marketplace of proven digital and hybrid solutions that come from world-leading companies, startups, industrials, and vendors. For industrials in particular, we, we help them take what could be innovative yet bespoke solutions they've built to solve specific operational challenges and help extract that technology and package it up and take them to uh, take it to market and help similar companies on the buy side take advantage of their sort of expert work. Those searching for solutions to business sort of challenges, we can offer this sort of world's class set of uh, innovative technologies. They're proven, they've been tested, road tested, stress tested, and combined with a strong focus on putting it all in sort of context of the industry value chain. And when you see, you see our website will be all about the industry itself and the value chain and insights and challenges. And we're really here to help you transform your business using the best that digital can offer. So we like to say, uh, welcome to Exora, discover innovation and unlock transformation. So thank you again for joining and let's get started on the topic of um, sustainability. You know, I think if you are watching live, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A window and our team will monitor that for you. And we'll do the Q&A at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to post them as we go. So with no further ado, let me hand to Pat Lowry, who'll take us through the great content we've prepared. Over to you, Pat. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Nick, and welcome everybody to my COVID-19 shelter. My, uh, I don't think my hair's been this long since 1979, when I was a second year metallurgical engineering student at Pitts University. But uh, one of these days, I promise myself I'm going to go for another haircut. Just as a bit of a content summary, we're going to we're going to in the next half hour have a look at mining site in the 21st century and where, where the sustainability journey uh, is, uh, is taking us. Some of the growing pressures on the, on the, on the mining operations and, and projects. Have a look at a few, uh, a few examples, uh, pretty solid examples, I think. And building, uh, looking at building a more sustainable industrial strategy. We have in the content uh, a few more examples. You'll find those in your presentation and uh, a bit of a, a question and answer for chief executives around uh, the carbon, the carbon economy. Uh, I doubt if we'll get to that, so we've moved that into the uh, moved that into the appendix. That you can have a look at that. Uh, I think it's fair that we really need to see this as a teaser. I think um, each element that we're trying to discuss in this webinar is 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 worthy of a a webinar on its on its own. And we'll look to uh, Nick and the uh, Exora team to see how they how they roll that out in the uh, in the future. So. Uh, while I was preparing this, um, while I was preparing this presentation, uh, two or three months ago, I under, uh, wrote across the top of my paper, as we all do, you know, the opening line, and I said the principle of environmental, social, and corporate governance are more relevant now than ever. And uh, I had no idea when we were putting this presentation together of what was coming at us and the whole COVID nineteen issue. And I think it's uh, it goes without saying that over the next few weeks, uh, months, uh, we're definitely going to be entering a new uh, sustainable sustainability reality. And uh, even though this was extremely important a few months ago, the whole content and uh, topic of sustainability is going to be uh, top of agenda for, for many mining companies, chief executives across industry in general uh, in the, in the, in the uh, immediate future. So I think, uh, you know, in general, governments and shareholders and society are demanding from mining companies that uh, we adhere to sustainable ways of operating. And uh, 
like myself, I'm sure many people in the audience are involved in in, uh, in mining projects, and uh, I'm definitely finding now that the the technical issues that I've I've been trained for and have dealt with over the past you know, 30 and 40 years are actually the easy bits. Um, we're, we're we're pretty good at uh, we're pretty good at the technical stuff, uh, but the uh, the sustainability stuff, the getting together with the social performance issues, understanding all the environmental and permitting and all of the stuff that goes uh, to the to the project, which incorrectly several years ago we would have described as peripheral, are, are now the are now the core business and uh, really need a, a whole different uh, a whole different approach. So I, I just inc included a quote in the presentation that Mark Kudivani gave at the mining in Darwin, Cape Town, a few months ago. And, uh, and once again, I'm sure I, I know Mark reasonably well, and he would have he would have really said this with uh, with default meaning. I know uh, Mark takes sustainability very seriously. Uh, I would be really interested to see what his uh, his quote would be on the fourth of May because I think it would be much stronger than even the, you know, the strong words that he used in, in Cape Town. So other mining companies take, taking sustainability seriously? Well, I think if we look at the, uh, the membership of, a, of the uh, UN Global Compact, you can see that, I mean, a very impressive graph, 13 and a half thousand members. And 200, 200 members of them are from the, from the mining and oil and gas sector. So the, the, the companies are definitely taking it seriously from the point of view of, of membership of the, of the various clubs. And uh, there's a couple of the, you know, the big ticket signatories to the, to the compact. It's nowhere near all encompassing. There are, there are many, many people left off the list. But uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the big, the big companies are, are very serious about being in, the, being in the club. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, another very good framework for, um, for uh, government, uh, NGOs, interested parties, stakeholders, and uh, and companies to be. Uh, to be working from and uh, really ensuring alignment with uh, with the wider value-driven business, political and societal goals that we're all faced with at the moment. I think all the mining companies are faced with pressures to adhere to these um, adhere to these frameworks on on sustainability today. And uh, for those of you who haven't haven't picked up, it's it's well worth having a look at a couple of the chapters and understanding the context that's been set in the development of these. Uh, in the development of these goals. So the growing pressures on the mining industry, definitely the new reality is, is coming. But, but even today, I mean, we all, we all know, if you're involved in the industry, that the, the dripping roll, roasts of 20, 25 years ago that we used to stumble across in the felt and then make lots and lots of money out of are, are few and far between, if not, uh, if not gone. Uh, where we are doing our exploration work is in, is in far more remote and uh, inhospitable areas of the planet where, which are water constrained, uh, infrastructurally constrained, lower grade, deeper land covers. I mean the operational pressures just go, are just continuous and are not going to get uh, not going, going to get any easier. And over overlaid on those uh, operational economic challenges are all of the social environmental performance pressures that come with uh, that come with that. Yeah you know, the question that comes to mind is I so I kind of move out of my career. <laughs> Hopefully my, my wife hopes I will retire one day. I'm not 100% sure that our PMs, our project managers, and our general managers are fully trained to deal with the right-hand side of, the, of, that, uh, of that slide compared to the left-hand side. I, I still meet a lot of very, very technically competent managers in our operations and on our projects. But I think we've we've really got to have a look within ourselves and within the teams that we're creating to 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 uh, operate, run, and build our, our new projects. It's whether or not, uh, from a social environmental perspective, um, they are uh, adequately uh, adequately resourced. Another brief quote from Mark, really just laying out. You know, we we do have we do have legacy issues in the mining industry. Uh, it was described several years ago as it's not a sexy industry anymore. You know, the young people want to go and work in IT. Uh, from a green perspective, it's very it has, it has had a very poor reputation. I think the the mining companies are doing a lot of good work. Uh, we've 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 demonstrated yeah, memberships of the various clubs. When you look at the um, 
when you look at the reports in society that come out every year now, they're full of, of glossy, really, really impressive uh, engagements with communities um, and various other initiatives that are sponsored sponsored out of the companies, and it's all looking it's all looking it's all looking good and better. But we don't need more than one issue, whether it's at a small mining company, a medium-sized mining company, or a large mining company. Because in my opinion, the external world doesn't differentiate between BHP, Rio Tinto, Valley, Anglo American. We are mining companies. Every single one of us, on, uh, we're in that club, and we're only as strong from a sustainability point of view as the weakest link. And we have to encourage each and every one of these companies, irrespective of how small they are, to be sticking to the principles of the um, uh, the UN Global Compact and the and the uh, and the frameworks that uh, that we just described. Failure to do so is just going to keep us in that legacy position of being a an unattractive uh, unattractive business the opportunities for for technology to make an impact sustainably i think you know, anybody who's an honest indian will say you know technology in the mining industry over the past past years has really been focused on operation improvements and meeting the meeting those operational and economic challenges i think um one of the one of the biggest challenges that mining industry has had is the is the cost of conversion it's very slow to convert and where the opportunities do exist, you know, from a capital perspective, it's very, very different to to uh, to turn this massive ship. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't we we don't have it in us uh, occasionally to uh, to make those changes. But that being said, many of the technologies that uh, can deliver these efficiency improvements that we've been working on for for, for many many years can also up, uh, also open up pathways to meet uh, sustainability goals. So I think. Technology will meet the uh, will meet not only the uh, efficient and lean operation um, agenda that we have, but can can help us with those uh, sustainability goals in the next in the next few years. So we've got we've got um, a couple of examples just broken up into into four chunks. Um, let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look briefly at uh, what some of the companies are doing. I think yeah, from autonomous machinery, which started off uh, several years ago. I mean, this is not new. This is not new as, at all. Um, it started off as a cost-cutting and uh, an efficiency uh, efficiency drive. And I think now more and more people are realizing, realizing there is a there's a huge sustainability sustainability backbone in here in terms of uh, continuous continuous operations, uh, minimization of um, emissions, and uh, uh, in general, uh, a much healthier, a much healthier business by being able to keep uh, keep our equipment at uh, in tip top performance, over and above uh, simple cost cost and operating efficiencies. Rio Tinto, uh, I guess this won't be news to many people who are familiar with the mining industry. For those of you outside, um, I mean, Rio Tinto have moved well over a billion tons of, of iron ore using autonomous trucks in the in the Pilbara. So it's no news to them, and I think Rio Tinto can be counted as the as the leader in this in this particular field. And of course, now expanding out into uh, automated drills, automated fleets, looking at integrating shovels, uh, it's uh, it, it's it lends great possibility from a from a sustainability point of view. And we can only encourage the the other mining companies where applicable to 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 pick up on this and uh, and move it forward. And to stop using the uh, the old the old adage of you know we need to try it ourselves. Uh, we have a company here that's moved a billion tons, so I think you can be pretty sure that it does actually work. I think uh, the the, um, the Gold Corp exercise was particularly uh, particularly impressive. For those of you who are not aware, it's a it's a mine about 180 kilometers east of Timmins in Canada, which typically in those road, remote environments would almost entirely be driven by by diesel, uh, Gold Corp is uh, is an entirely electrified operation. They've moved completely away from diesel. I've saved uh, a lot in that uh, in that turnover. They use Sandvik, uh, purely Sandvik equipment, uh, drill scoops and uh, and trucks, and they've cut uh, diesel consumption about two million liters a year, one million liters of propane, 
and they're saving about 7,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions per annum. That just shows what can be done uh, if we uh, if we put our mind to it and, uh, and make those mind make those mind shifts. Renewable energy, I think there is a a long way to go here. I think we all to use the to use the terminology loosely. I think we all play with it a little bit. You know, we like to put up the panels and and have the have the battery farms, but and there are a few uh, few examples in Australia and Canada where we're using hybrid diesel, the renewable energy uh, vehicles. But uh, I think the scope here is still uh, is still still enormous to uh, to pursue to pursue further. I like this little example. I think it's a I think it's pretty innovative in thinking. This is Minera Media Luna in, uh, in Mexico, where their process plant is down the bottom of that hill, as you can see on the right hand side of the of the picture. And by putting in the conveyor system, not only they've uh, they've been pretty innovative in uh, now capturing the uh, catching and generating electricity from the, uh, from the from the conveyor system to to supplement electrical power in the process plant. So again, uh, a little bit of out the box thinking there. To, to move briefly briefly on to digitalization, I, towards the end of my career, probably for the last seven or eight years, I mean, digitalization has been a, a topic that we've seen uh, you know, in many professional journals and hitting the mining industry with, uh, almost with a big stick, um, more applicable in those days to, to banking and, and various other uh, similar institutions. And I think for a long time, the, the, uh, the mining industry wrestled with exactly what this this whole concept of digitalization was about I mean, initially we pushed back and said well it's just a it's going to be hugely expensive to convert it systems and edps and how are we going to integrate all this massive information to create these data lakes and data mines and you know, intuitively uh, it just sounds like a, a whole lot of uh, money for for really very little um, progress but i think now over the over the past few years it really has um it really has taken off and uh, I think the opportunities are are massive and we can have a look at a couple of a uh, couple of examples so where we're, all, where we're already applying the uh, uh, the the, um, the digital approach um, just on a few of them I mean remote operating centers is and uh, capturing all of that information is is now from five six seven years ago being um, kind of a, a vision is now almost old hat, and I'm sure some of you have seen you know, the BHP centres, the Rio Tinto centres in America, in Australia, uh, controlling right the way down from uh, delivery of coal right the way through to loading ships and tracking individual, tracking individual tr trains, etc. I mean, it's really incredible the, the information that we can get from these remote operating operating centres. I think the, the whole license to operate and being able to digitalize what is required in terms of permits and checklists and controls to, to, to keep abreast with what is continuously changing uh, legislation and, and, and requirements. I think the connected mine is where many of us in the operations have been uh, probably uh, lagging behind and that's moving forward very quickly in terms of being able to engage with all our machines uh, from a from a maintenance point of view, from a productivity perform and performance point of view, and understanding 2D, 3D congestion issues, it's, it really has taken understanding mining uh, several several steps several steps forward. The connected worker and being able to know where our where our people are all the time, whether in open pits or underground, and uh, getting into collision avoidance and keeping men. Men and machinery separate has been a, you know, a great, great step forward. And I think one of the, the more recent applications, really with sustainability, looking at it through a sustainability lens, is the whole issue of uh, community engagement and being able to look at uh, look at our um, look at our community issues. And there's a there's a very good uh, example that I'll I'll talk to you about very briefly now. If we look into smart environmental monitoring in Chile. Yeah, very often in these remote locations, we don't really understand how the community is uh, is relating to uh, what we're doing upstream, downstream, uh, from a noise point of view, from a dust point of view, how we're interfering with their, their general livelihoods. Uh, they haven't seen us before. We're, we're, the, we're the, uh, 
with a new entrance. entrance. And in, in Chile, Tech Resources have done a really tremendous job in terms of online monitoring of water quality and very, very various other environmental compliance issues, which is integrated straight from the, straight from the instrumentation into reports, which are uh, directly shared with the uh, with all of the interested and affected parties that, uh, that live within their areas. So, so it, it really is taking digitalization to a new level from a sustainability point of view. So in terms of building a, a more sustainable industrial strategy, how do we engage mining in the, in the, green, the green economy? Envir effective environmental regulation. I think the, wherever we're working, wherever we go to in the planet, there are, there are the environmental codes. We need to understand them. We need to accept that they're not the same in each jurisdiction. And we need, as, as, a, as an industry, to adopt them, uh, to stick to them, and insist that they're consistently applied. I think that's the, from, 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 from my own perspective, that's this um, inconsistent application where those who can do and those who can't kind of buy their way out of it is, uh, is just not, uh, is not going to meet the sustainability goals of the future. In general, there are national strategies for the mining sector right there across, rather right across uh, all the jurisdictions. We have you know, different royalty methods, we have different calculations, we have different expectations, and we need to understand, understand those in the jurisdictions that we're operating. Again, uh, yeah, focusing on cleaning up the old contaminated sites, et cetera, and making sure that, you know, where, as and where we can, we, uh, we clean up some of these, uh, we clean up some of these legacy issues. Stakeholder engagement for me is probably one of the most complex uh, and understated elements of, uh, of the mining, mining industry and sustainability in the future. And this is something we, we, really have to, we really have to get on top of. And I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges is when we say we need to engage with you know, the broadest stakeholder involvement, one of, the, one of the most significant challenges in the environments that we live in is even understanding who they who those who those people are and how to engage with them and who's actually calling the who's calling the shots who are the right people to engage with so i think there's a lot of work to be done there and to a point made earlier i'm not 100 percent sure that very often in our, in our industry the people that we're putting out there to to uh, to manage run operate our, uh, our, our our minds and our projects are, uh, are fully equipped to to meet that to meet that challenge, again, lots of regulatory tools that are that are coming into uh, to to force to force the mining industry into some form of compliance. I think there's uh, again nothing nothing wrong with that at all. But again, we've got to insist on consistent consistent application. And I think from a, one of the examples of, of collaboration, which is the ICSV. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that, but it's a it's a collaborative effort between 27 of the world's leading mining companies. And there's various commitments that are being made that are, are listed on the slide there in terms of emission-free emission -free surface vehicles, uh, diesel exhaust systems, and making collision avoidance technology available. And this collaborative program is, is working very hard to roll out those, uh, uh, those initiatives. And it seems to be, uh, it seems to be working. The, the old adage of you know, keeping your cards close to your chest, uh, I think, in a in a true sustainable environment that we're all thriving for, uh, is not necessarily the the future way. And there's a lot more um, opportunity for collaboration. The deep decarbonisation strategy. We could probably have four or five webinars on this topic on its own. So I, I don't have any any intention of uh, of talking to this for any any length of time, other than to say that what I've seen in in the in this industry in my in my twilight time and what I what I gauge now when I'm dealing with projects in in development in my in my retirement is that this is probably reasonably well understood at a corporate level in most of the companies that I deal with, but once you get much below corporate level and you're looking at how is this? Uh, how is the decarbonisation strategy rolling down into the 
actual assets and into the projects, uh, you have to dig very hard and long to, uh, to find any, uh, any real activity there. So I think there's a long, long way to go in terms of understanding how our engineering designs in our projects can, uh, can impact uh, decarbonization. So I hope you've, uh, I think that's, that's, spot, that's spot on time. So uh, uh, as I say, I think that there was enough, there's enough content there for, for half, a dozen, half a dozen webinars, but I, I hope we've, we've wet your whistle and uh, please have a look at the further examples in the appendices and um, I look forward to if you have any questions. Fantastic, Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Uh, well done, Pat. Good job. Um, and as you said, I think it's really clear from this. We've just scratched the surface here. So from our uh, guest today and uh, and anyone watching on demand, uh, you know, we'd love to hear where you'd like us to go next. Uh, you know, what's uh, what's the, the subtopics to drill in in more detail? Uh, we actually have got a substantial number of questions, Pat. So it's a good job that we're running on time. So uh, um, so what I'll do is I'm going to go um, in order of um, what's called upvoting. So the most popular questions uh, will go first, uh, except I've got one question that came in very early on, which I think is actually quite foundational, which I would start with, actually. Um, and the question was um, starting, you know, what's the what's your definition of sustainability in mining? Um, you know, it's a broad, open question, but it's a good one. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a very, it's 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 a very good question. Uh, you could probably write a PhD on it. Um, I think what I what I would like to see is sustainable mining is is that we understand principally we understand our communities, we understand how to engage with them, and I'm not talking here about you know, the sim simplistic approach of uh, you know, teaching people how to weld and involving them in a in a project that's going to evolve for the next fifteen years. Uh, to me, sustainability is really having a holistic understanding of what the impacts are going to be of your venture on the environment and the population within which you're working, and that throughout the lifetime of that operation, we make every effort possible to mitigate it so that when we walk away at the end of the, the mining operation, um, the local people have grown from the uh, grown from the opportunity and the environment doesn't even know we were there i think that would be uh that would be a pretty satisfactory outcome the environment doesn't even know we're there that's a sound bite i think we could capture that <laughs> for a banner um fabulous pat thank you very much right so i've we've probably got about 10 questions uh, for those on the call um, please do feel free to throw some more in i am going to go in order of uh, popularity the the upvoting uh, function um, and I'll work my way down, but you've got a couple of minutes to throw some more questions in as we wrap this up. So first one, um, which is uh, actually very popular, five, five odd votes. Um, how can mining companies better leverage and learn from each other's technologies? Yeah, I think, I think yeah, we, we, I, I tried to make that point in the, in the presentation, you know, this whole, this whole issue of, of, of collaboration across the, uh, across the mining, across the mining companies. You know, there are there've been various forums, and I know some of them are still, you know, the, the mirrors of the world, etc., are still are still working. And I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to collaborate through those through those type of forums. I think uh, we need to we need to encourage our, our technical our technical executives, our environmental executives, you know, to get some cross cross mining forums going. You know, we, we're pretty good at doing these things within our own companies and. And having our you know, our um, our whiteboard and and and, and pain type of uh, events, and I think uh, we need a conscious effort to uh, to uh, to play the game across the industry. I think there's a willingness, and I think you know, this whole protect. As I said, I think yes, holding your cars to your chest is kind of is dying a little bit because uh, you know it's hugely expensive to to do this kind of uh, research and development and work independently. So I think yeah co-funding and and really really pushing those type of collaborative forums is the, is the way to go and i must do um, a plug for exora here because i mean in, in many ways uh exora has been formed to actually solve that sort of uh, opportunity and help that um you know our early estimates uh, research done by uh, boston consulting group said there's 200 billion worth of, of ip that's just duplicated in in sort of industrial companies uh, which mining of course is a 
as a big part. So, uh, you know, our role here is to help bring technology to life and help bring technology out of the, the mines and help other mines, mining companies, um, you know, find this, this great innovation that's being, uh, being done. Okay, um, next question. Thank you, Pat, for that one. Um, what do you think is the tipping point for mining operations to be genuinely sustainable and what's standing in the way? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, there's a, there's kind of a sorry to say in the, in that type of answer, but personally, I mean, the, the, the economic driver is never going to go away. I mean, that's, that's what it, that's what it's about. I think, um, I think hopefully in the future, you know, given what we've come through now and, you know, the, the change undoubtedly that's going to come in the whole sustainability agenda, I think, I'm uh, hoping that this, you know, this myopic focus of, of uh, stockbrokers on you know, quarterly results is is going to is going to lift a little bit <laughs> because uh, I think that's that's holding that's holding back a lot of innovative thinking, particularly in the you know in the more longer term in the in the more longer term issues like sustainability. Um, so I think the tipping point is going to be is going to become uh, when the the stakeholders, including the shareholders really start to hold the, the, the mining companies to to account and uh, you know that these indices that we see on the various stock exchanges around the world and uh, sustainability indices and things when when you're positioning on those kind of uh, indices actually really start to impact uh, the price the share price then the chief executives of the world and their executive committees are gonna are gonna sit up and, uh, and really play the game yeah, and you told me before that's been a relatively new development, right? The last couple of years, where that index has become quite a kind of board level uh, relevant, where where people take notice of it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Fantastic. Okay, next question: uh, Do you think blockchain, and in particular the use of private blockchain in supply chain management and execution of smart contracts, will actually stand up to the hype? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean. Uh... I haven't really been involved much in the in the, in the whole development of blockchain. I mean, I know uh, that the beers have been in the press about having done a lot of work on that. But uh, yeah, it was it was post it was post me. <laughs> so I, I'm 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 not really qualified. I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you a story if I don't have one. So I'm not really qualified to comment on uh, on 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 that type of uh, on on that question. So hey, I'd, I'd I'd rather say nothing than than uh, than waffle on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we know it's a very fast growing area, right? So, you know, the current state versus the state in one year, two years, three years and five years is is going to change rapidly, right? And we're aware of uh, certainly Xora is partnering with a number of organizations that are in this space. Um, and you're going to see, you know, trading uh, sort of happen in, in cryptocurrency, uh, amongst other things, as well as sort of provenance type uh, solutions coming to bear. So uh, certainly it's going to be interesting. But um, OK, yeah. great. Great. Um, just someone asking for a bit of advice here. How can I keep up to date with current technology trends in mining? So yeah. Well. Um, read. <laughs> there's lots and lots of uh, there's lots and lots of good journals out there that um, uh, you can you can you can you can get up up to date with. And many of the many of the big mining companies now you know, on their on their websites. I mean, I, I given my history, I know. Uh, yeah, I know a lot about the Anglo American uh, company, and I mean, if you just go directly to their website, they they can describe quite nicely for you what their, you know, their future technology, uh, future technology approach is. As as if you go and look at Rio Tinto or BHP Bulletin, you know, I'm not so familiar with it with the uh, with the other companies, but very definitely you can you can pick you can pick up from you can pick up from there. And there are there are various clubs. Yeah, you know, I mean there are. Uh, Various international technology clubs. Um, there's a very good Canadian one whose name has just escaped me. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll, I'll give it to Nick for that he can communicate on. But I mean, there, there are various levels of membership of these uh, of these collaborative groups that you can that you can have you know, from simply being informed of what is happening right through to you know core committee membership and deciding the approach. But uh, yeah, I'd recommend if you're in a if you're in a, a smaller company with uh, with limited limited resources or budget, you just join these join these things as, uh, as kind of a, an information piece rather than uh, being an active member. 
No, um, that's a great idea. We'll we'll certainly find a way to publish out some resources and ideas uh, around sort of uh, keeping up to date. Uh, Exora itself publishes sort of insights on technology trends as well, but obviously we're a relatively small startup, so there's a lot of resources out there, and we'll try and gather uh, gather together relevant resources with some of Pat's uh, reading list and uh, ones that we use ourselves. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, next question: Do you believe large mining companies are really taking sustainability as seriously as they claim? I do know the answer to this one because we've uh, we've had some. Um, time together uh, that Pat uh, will, I'm sure, uh, reaffirm. But I think he's answered this question already, which is the, uh, the the board level accountability is making a big difference. The the, the stock exchange indices on sustainability uh, is, is really making a big difference. So um, that's the accountability layer, if you wish, uh, raising raising quite quite heavily. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to park that one. I think we, we actually have oh, we've got Pat back. That's good. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. That's as okay. Soon as, I said, uh, I, as soon as I said I didn't know much about blockchain and and the uh, latest IT systems, uh, somebody switched me off. That's all right. I answered the last question on your behalf because <laughs> I think I know we've covered it already, which was the uh, are large mining companies taking sustainability as seriously as they claim? I think that was very much about the board level, um, you know, the board level yeah. accountability. Um, so we'll I, move. Think it, I think it's there. Yeah, it's there. It is there now. What we've got to make sure is you know, my, my, my probably a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, comment around you know, my myopic uh, stockbrokers, as long as we can keep them in check and let the guys focus on the on the bigger ticket and longer-term issues for, for a while, I'm sure, uh, sure things will change. Yeah. All right, next question. We've got a couple more to go. Um, how can smaller, less resourced companies be encouraged to engage in the sustainability discussion? And to operationalize these ideas more quickly, I, I think that I think everybody can con, con, can contribute. You know, I, I, it's a it is a it is difficult if you if you're in a you know, in businesses that don't don't have the resources that that uh, can uh, can do the type of work that the majors are doing. Uh, but um, yeah, everybody can can stick to the everybody can stick to the rules. You know, if you can't stick to the rules, you shouldn't be in the business because then you. You kind of you, know, you you don't have the money to be doing it properly. So so uh, yeah, you, please uh, let's let's look at it from let's look at it from that perspective. And yeah, you know, it's all about it's all about reputation, and it's all about getting that get, changing the hearts and minds of the of the of the people and the the environments that we that we live in. So whether you're a small company, a big company, or whatever, you've got to be out there. Talking to the people, selling to the people what it is that you're doing from a, an environmental point of view, uh, communicating. Let's let's all agree that you know over the next 10, 15, 20 years, what we're going to do is we're going to turn around that impression that the uh, your mining companies are are dirty and, and be a, to be avoided. Uh, let's turn it into a, a clean, clean, clean environment where where communities are actually welcoming mining companies in rather than resisting them from 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 uh, from the beginning great thank you pat um good question though uh next question how could the current and future low oil price outlook affect the drive towards electrification in terms of operational costs yeah as as i said yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question because i mean the mining industry is just one of cyclic yeah it's one that has to has to deal with cyclic um Cyclic issues all the time, be it from price, be it from you know, um, uh, commodity price, be it from uh, you know, issues like we have at the moment with with diesel diesel price. You know, and I, yeah, I think that is the challenge uh, when you're looking at things from a sustainability point of view uh, in the mining industry all the time. Is that very often the cost of conversion or comparing doing A to B from an economic point of view. From a pure MPV IRR point of view, it doesn't work. Mm. The numbers just don't stack up. And I think that's one of the things where the chief executives have got to stand up now. The boards have got to accept, accept is that for the long term future of the um, mining industry from a sustainability point of view, that sometimes, I mean, not all the time, and you know, we need to avoid it as much as we can. But sometimes we're going to have to invest 
in things that don't make pure economic sense. Yeah, I mean, Exora is about to publish, I think, Pat, you know this, <laughs> we're about to publish a, a white paper in the next week or so, which is about the, the sort of COVID impact on, on mining operations. And, you know, you know we'd, we'd like to think it's been a very, you know, damaging crisis for all industries, you know, mining included. But, but some some organizations are going to come out stronger right they will have they'll have accelerated their automation approaches you know they will have uh, accelerated some things that perhaps protect them from crises like this in the future that should hopefully make them more efficient and, and more, more responsive if you wish yep. so seize the opportunity yeah uh, right um what's the what do you think is the most challenging issue right now for mining in relation to sustainability i think it's that uh, well i can i can Straight away, I can say, in my opinion, in the jurisdictions that I'm familiar with, it is the it's the reputational issue uh, associated with the way that historically mining companies have um, uh, be careful with the words you right, use here, but kind of run a little bit roughshod over over the people that uh, over the, the the communities that are in their in their general general areas. And uh, I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody could say that we have, uh, we've engaged or taken them into consideration uh, as much as we, as much as we should have. And I think turning that, turning that around, I think is the, is the biggest challenge. From the other aspects, you know, the environmental challenges of, yeah, you know, how to avoid pollution, how to build tailing stands correctly. I mean, we have major events like we had in Brazil, and that puts the clock back 10 or 15 years from a reputation point of view. And these are all big challenges. But I think technically knowing what to do, I think all the mining companies, they, they know what to do now. It's that uh, it's the softer, it's what we always used to refer to as the softer issues that are, are, are the barriers and getting on top of those community relationships are uh, to me, to me, number one. Yeah, I see. Actually, caring around the heritage issues and the uh, the, the resettlement issues, and uh, and getting on top of uh, having really strong policies and practices that uh, that uh, are welcoming, are, are welcomed rather than rather than resisted. That's that to me is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Right. Um one of the only advantages for local communities is the possibility of higher paying jobs and steady economic benefits. I guess the question really is, yeah, as you drive autonomy into um, mining, you know, it, what's the offset? Does it affect local uh, communities where large mines will operate? Look, it's a, it's a very, it's a very, very real issue that and a very, very good question. And it's, it's relevant to a couple of the projects that I'm personally working on, working on at the moment, you know, yeah, in, in the again in the environments that we're working in, you know, do you how do you possibly sell automation where you know you're you're working in a local community where 60, 70 percent of the population are unemployed? Uh, I think that's a it's a it's a very real it's a very real moral and uh, economic challenge that the 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 the, uh, the mining companies are, are are facing, and I think that that whole management of expectation. Of, of uh, local communities, particularly given you know, some of the legislation that's emerging in the around the world in terms of you know, employment of local communities, I think it's it's that's very very challenging. I don't think we quite have a grasp yet on what the impact of some of this legislation truly is on on project cost and schedule. I think we've got to get our minds around that and and build all of this information into our into our QRAs. I think the the economics are a very very substantial effect a very substantial effect behind it and i think we've got to be very careful with with uh, with um how do we how do we develop the community so once we start to understand where it is that we're going i believe we can employ a lot of pe people out of the communities but we have to be able to get in there train and develop them from very early on otherwise uh, yeah you end up at the end of the day as we all know with with people who are, are underqualified and really only able to do very menial, mm. very menial work. So that whole uh, engagement is, is, is mission critical. I feel that whole topic is going to evolve over time as the levels of automation, uh, you know, increase, yep. which is, is inevitable. It's going to happen. But as you said, doing it in a responsible way and sort of sympathetic way is going to be really important. Yeah. 
Okay, last couple of questions. But um, in your opinion, what's the most exciting new technology trend? Oh, yeah, that's a that's an interesting. I think I think this whole. Um, I don't think we've scratched the surface yet of what um, what 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 digitalization can offer us. I think I think the the scope there is is um, is immense in terms of understanding understanding our business to that level of of detail but more importantly being able to produce information to assist to assist managers in eking out that loss those last little bits of uh, of productivity i i think the technically being able to integrate that whole that whole piece is uh, is amazing i was uh, I was at a presentation not so long ago where we were doing, where we were being shown, you know, 3D, 3D open pit images that we could actually play with on a boardroom table and move move trucks and vehicles around and undo blocks, you know, like in a in a um, in a PlayStation game. And it was, I think that that kind of, if we can get to that level, it'll be it'll be really amazing as to what what impacts we can have with non-technical people you know, there's nothing better than a picture but you know the next level up is actually being able to put them in a headset and stick them in a mine while they're in an office in london yeah they will, they will really start to win it augmented reality and those kind of things i think are very powerful yeah, exactly yeah. yeah no okay fantastic that's exciting um what do you think mining will look like in 10 20 or 30 years time Oh well, wow. well. Uh, hopefully, I'll be sipping pina coladas somewhere in the Caribbean and looking down at it. Without uh, <laughs> that, that's that's my that's my key ambition now. But I think yeah, it's going to be a it is going to be a much a much more automated, much more automated industry. It has to move forward from 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 where it is now to uh, to a new space over the next 10, 20, 30 years. I think we're going to see a lot less a lot less people. We're going to see a lot of highly qualified people. And we're going to see that that business that's is able to function with a minimum water input, uh, minimum environmental footprint, and get to this type of uh, this type of business where, yeah, once we've uh, once we've finished the environment, didn't know we were there. And hopefully, you yeah, know, that's that's where we'll be in thirty years' time. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll capture this in the recording pattern. We'll look, we'll come back and look at your prediction uh, in, in due course. <laughs> I think. Uh, and this was actually an early question that came in. Um, where does the mining value chain end? I mean, where do you sort of draw the line in mining value chain? Yeah, oh, geez, I think with the yeah, with a it's kind of with a mining hat on, with a De Beers hat on. You know, De Beers is not a mining company; it's a it's a uh, a luxury goods company with a mine on the front. So uh, that value chain is very different, uh, but I think in a in a typical mining company, the value chain has to be in place until such time as we understand where the products where the products are on. I mean, the recycling industry is just growing and growing and growing. So I think there's a there's a degree of responsibility for not only producing the the raw component, but also understanding where it's gone, what it's what it's used for. Um, I think the value chain is right the way through to the end to the usage point. Mm. Yeah, I think it varies according to the company themselves, of course, as you exactly. said, De Beers right. being at the jewelers again, effectively, right? I mean, yeah. Um, and there's one last question which is in the chat window, which I think is really interesting. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap the session with this last question, and then I'll just do a, a small wrap at the end. Should mining educators start to train mining sustainability as a core project development and operation system? Yes, I think that's a that's a very it's a very simple question. I think university education um, has has lagged the business in, business requirement now since since I was in it, uh, 40 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, throughout my early career, nobody at university was being taught how to deal with people at all. I mean, management didn't come into it. They were purely technical technical courses and technical degrees we did. I think maybe that comes a little bit more recently, but yes, to be having sustainability as 
separate parts of uh, a training uh, training initiative, education initiative, or um, tertiary education. It's a it's a must now. It's no it's no longer a nice to have. Yeah. Well, fabulous. Uh, Pat, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been uh, really, really insightful. Some lovely comments coming in the chat window. Uh, we had just, just shy of 100 uh, people come join us today. So uh, a great turnout. So thank you to everyone who joined today. Um, you know, we're excited to launch the Exora business into the mining and oil and gas worlds and more sectors to come. Uh, and you can expect much more of this kind of conversation with us um around insight led uh, you know insight led expertise uh, around the mining sector uh, and other sectors that we go into so uh we're going to make this uh, webinar available on demand so people can can look back at it and also the slides themselves and as pat said earlier there's plenty of case studies at the back of the uh, slide deck that you didn't see today so lots of value for you to uh, go download the deck um and i just i'll end up with saying again thank you very much for joining us today and uh, we'll close the webinar off goodbye everybody